We have been talking about getting into the wilderness for the last couple weeks. How when we get into the wilderness, we get away from all the noise. We're not in control of everything. We can see a long distance. And as we've been talking about this, talking about the people who have gone in the wilderness in Scripture, Moses, Elijah, Jesus, John the Baptist... We've been talking about individuals, and we've been talking about taking a hike into the wilderness individually during this Lenten season. But there are times when it's not just a single person who's out in the wilderness. There are times when you're out there with a group. There are times when a family is in the wilderness because of the death of a loved one, floundering to find its way forward, or whether it's a divorce or a sudden tragedy. It's not just families that can be in the wilderness. It can be entire churches when a church splits or there's a a tragedy or or a church you look around you're wondering, what do we do next? Or, Or entire communities can end up in the wilderness. Even states or nations as they try to figure out where where do you go from here after some sort of event, something happens. And so while we read the stories of the faithful in Scripture, and they are often stories of people alone in the wilderness, there are also these stories of when people take a hike together. They go in the wilderness as a, as a people, and God has a plan for how that works out too. And we see this, at, we see this, uh, this case when the Hebrew people are on their journey to the promised land. And it's the story told in the book of Exodus and then the following books. And we know the story of Exodus, right? We've seen the movie, Prince of Egypt, or the Charlton Heston one, Ten Commandments. And we know the beginning of the story. This child named Moses is born, is put into a river. The princess, the daughter of Pharaoh, pulls him out of the river, raises him as a prince of Egypt. He is raised up. He... uh, kills one of the guards on the Hebrew slaves, runs into the wilderness. Yeah, that wilderness keeps on coming up. Runs into the wilderness, spends many years out there. God speaks to him through the burning bush on the side of the mountain. He comes back from the wilderness, tells Pharaoh to let my people go. Pharaoh says no. Moses says, you're going to regret that. Eventually Moses does convince Pharaoh to let my people go after multiple, multiple plagues. And then the people, they leave, they, they take a hike, uh, the Pharaoh changes his mind, sends his army across him. They go through the Red Sea. The waters crush down on the army. And then Miriam sings a song, Yay God. And then the credits roll, right? That, that's how they tell the story of, of the Exodus. And it's a great story. It's a wonderful story. It's only the prologue, though. Because there's a whole lot more that happens next. It's a great first act. But there's a lot that follows. And what follows is what we're looking to, at today. When the people take a hike and, and that, t- that time between the Red Sea and entering the Promised Land many years later. Psalm 95 gives us the Cliff Notes version of this. It talks about, Do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa. Those names talk about mean bitterness, that uh, these are bitter days. When your ancestors tested me, put me to the proof, and so I sent them into the desert for 40 years. That, that's the, the short version. If you want to know the long version of what happened, or at least the full version, it, it, you, you read from the end of Exodus until you get to, to Joshua. And that's, I sat down to read that all at once this week, and it, it covers a bit of territory. Because it, it begins with the Hebrew people, they're, they're, they're hiking. They get away from the Red Sea, and one of the first things they do is complain, because the water they have to drink is bitter. Moses! Yeah, and so they, uh, Moses goes and touches the water with his staff, as God commands, and, and the water is pure. And uh, then they complain about not having meat. Moses! And so uh, God sends manna, and so they have something to eat. And, and they're told how to gather it, and how much to gather it, and they promptly gather too much, and it rots. They, they figure that out. And, and so then they get to a place called Rephidim, and they complain about not having any water. They get to Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments. They get all the rules, the guidance, how to treat servants, crime and punishments, family complications, holidays. And then the people make a golden calf which is a sermon unto itself. And then, uh, then the people sit out again and they complain that life is too hard. They, they, this manna is getting tired. This, this food they don't have to work for. They, they're tired of it. They just want something to eat. They want some meat. You know, like back like they had in Egypt. It sounds like the back to Egypt committee is really is forming and going strong. 
And, and so they, they whine and complain all the way over to the, the edge of their promised land. And, and we read what happens next. They send in one person from each of the 12 tribes. And for 40 days they, they search out the land and they see this land is great. One cluster of grapes, it takes two of us to carry. This is awesome. And the people there are really big, and they're going to whoop us. And so they, that's their report when they come back. Of the 12 of them, 11 of them say, great land, we go in, they're going to get us. And one of them, um, actually two of them, Caleb and Joshua, they, they say, you know what, God's got us thus far, let's trust God. But the 10, well, they complain louder. They whine about it louder. And the people follow those ten. Even though they've watched God free them from the dominant military power of the day, Egypt, even though God has kept them safe across that great stretch of land, even though God has protected their children thus far, they start whining. You know, why didn't we just go back to Egypt? Why didn't we die there? If we go in there, they're going to take our children. They're going to slaughter us. And so God sends them into the desert. God sends them into the wilderness. God sends them into the wilderness until they stop whining, until they learn to pay attention to what God teaches, and they start being willing to trust God and to take some risks. And, and that's exactly what happens. That uh, the, the people, they, they turn around, they leave the promised land, and they go back in the wilderness, and immediately God continues to teach them, giving Moses more to teach them about how, how they should live, about um, how you do offerings, how do you handle unintentional sin, and, and that it just continues to unfold, this story, over the next uh, books of the Bible, over 40 years, uh, of the people... They still whine, but over time they start to whine less. And, and over time they, they learn what God is teaching them. And over time they see that God protects them against the Edomites, the Amorites, and they see that God is going to tr- protect them. And, and, and they get to a point, it does take 40 years, where the people in the wilderness, they stop whining, they learn how God wants them to live, and they trust God enough to take a risk. And then they get to the promised land, and they enter the promised land. Now, as they enter the promised land, they are warned. As you go in the promised land, you've learned your lesson. You've learned the, the lessons of the wilderness. Don't whine. Pay attention to what God teaches, and uh, make sure to trust God enough to take some risks. But God warns them, you know, your kids, they're going to remember. Your kids' kids, they'll remember this too. But down the road, at some point, your ancestors are going to forget what you learned in the wilderness. And when they, when they forget this, they're going to have to go in the wilderness so, so that they can learn. And that's exactly what happens. It, it's in Deuteronomy that we read this warning, and, and down the road, the people do have to go in the wilderness again. Except this time it's called exile. The Babylonian Empire comes in and conquers Israel, and, and the people go into exile. But watching this and learning of this moment in the story of the people of God, I hope that we can see not just the importance of individually us going into the wilderness, but how we as a group, we as families, we as a church, we as a community, there is a value of be, for being in the wilderness. That, that we learn these very important aspects about how to follow Jesus. We learn the importance of not whining of not whining about water or food as they did then, forming the Backed Egypt Committee. Or today, there, there's also whining. We whine about different things today. The, the, the whining about people these days, and they don't, just don't act like we expect them to do, or this group or that group. And uh, as I think about what's going on as people are whining, I have this, I can imagine that someone's sitting there and saying, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it. And someone's right next to them saying, I'll show you how if you'll just stop your whining. And once the people stop their whining, then God can start to teach them. How do you live? How do you follow God? The entire time in the wilderness, God is giving Moses teachings, and then that guidance is being given to the people to learn. And so once they stop whining, they start learning. And uh, I don't think it's a coincidence then that the two times that the people of God in the Old Testament spend the most time paying attention to Scripture are the two times they're in the wilderness. The reason we have the Old Testament 
is because in the first time that they were in the wilderness, that's when they memorized it. The word of God came to Moses. Moses gives it to the people of God and they memorize it word for word. So it's passed down orally from, from father to son to so on down so that they will not forget how they should live. And then later on when they go into exile again, the Babylonian captivity in that wilderness, that's when they write this all down. They have all of this that's been passed down to them, all the word of God. It's in the Babylonian captivity when they're, in, when they're in the wilderness again. That's when they take all the words of Moses and it becomes something written down. It becomes the Bible as we would think of it today. <coughs> and this third lesson of the wilderness that the only way to get out of the wilderness is to take risks. The only way that the people of God got out of the desert was to take the risk of going into the promised land. The only way that the people got out of the Babylonian captivity was to be willing to risk going back to Israel to rebuild. And the only way we get out of the wilderness is to trust God enough to take some risks and trust that God's word is going to sustain us and guide us. It might not come as a surprise to say that I think the church is in the wilderness today. There are ways in which we as a church are in the wilderness. We are looking to find our way. We are a church that is trying to learn these lessons. And uh, I had an experience of, this week, uh, experience of this this week that was too perfect. You'll just have to trust me, I'm not making this up. But it was just too perfect an example of this. I was on a, a, it's a, it was a closed book in Facebook where Methodist pastors can ask advice of each other. And uh, someone uh, in another state, not Missouri, put up a link to a, a blog, an a online uh, article, by a young woman who has the gall to critique the church. She has the gall to say that the church is not perfect. And she's been doing this for a while. And two other folks, also not, this is not here in our local community, two other folks jumped on this and started saying, you know, how dare she critique the church? How dare she say the church is anything less than perfect? And, and, and I, I responded, you know, it seems like she's right. The church isn't perfect, and she says it's not perfect in this way, and, and then they jumped on me. But uh, <laughs> I really haven't responded yet. I don't know if I should. But it was very odd to, to, to read this because I, have, I don't see it much anymore. I don't see people whining and complaining about, you know, those young kids, they just don't, they, didn't, they don't get it. They don't love the church. They don't understand. I don't see that often. I don't hear... Uh, from the Back to Egypt Committee, which today would be the Back to the 1950s Committee. You hear it sometimes, but thanks be to God, y'all don't whine. Can I just say thank you? Y'all don't whine. And I cannot tell you how much I appreciate that. What I see far more of today at this church, at Green City as well, what I see far more of is this second lesson of the wilderness being learned, that if we're going to find our way forward, we find our way forward in attending very closely to what God has to teach. We find our way forward in attending to God's word and attending to Jesus' footsteps and trying to line up behind them. And most importantly, that third lesson of the wilderness. I see that we are willing to take some risks. And, and I am very proud of us. I'm very proud that, that we are willing to take some risks. Just this last week, we had our ministry meeting, and we were talking about uh, what is going to happen next. And one of the things we talked about was something called the Small Church Initiative, which is a way to bring in other uh, pastors in Missouri, Methodist pastors in Missouri, who will come in and help you see where to go next. These are other pastors who have led growing rural churches who are willing to show up and help us see where we might go. And that's a risk. When you invite three people in to spend the weekend chatting with you about what's next, to say, you know what, here's what we see wrong, here's what you might do to fix it, that's not exactly comfortable. But we agreed that we want to look into this. And that's a risk. And what, what's happening back here? Did y'all notice we're one, we, we lost a house this week? It went poof. It went down fast. This is a risk behind us. What's, what's happening behind us that we are taking this corner and we're saying this is going to be the community's corner. This is going to be a space where we can meet people. We are devo devoting a lot of time and effort to the sole purpose of just getting into our community 
and meeting people we have not yet met before. That's a risk. We're getting out of the walls of the church. And so when I say that we as a church are in the wilderness, that's not a problem. What that is is saying that we are in a place and time where God is teaching us to stop whining, check, to pay attention to what God teaches, we're doing it, and to learn to take some risks and trust that God is going to be good. And that's what, that's what we're doing here. We're doing good work, aren't we? Now, this is such an important way of understanding what God is doing that it shows up in the Old Testament. There's the book of Hebrews. That would be the book after Philemon, in case you're trying to find it. And uh, the entire book of Hebrews takes this imagery of, of wilderness and rest and uses it to explain what it means to seek God's will and to talk about heaven. Here's how it lays it out. It says... It talks about, it quotes Psalm 95, and it says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Therefore, I was angry with the generation that did. They will not enter my rest. Therefore, while the promise of entering this rest is still open, let us take care that none of us shall have failed to reach it. And we hear the good news. This is in Hebrews uh, 3. A Sabbath rest still remains for the people of God. For those who enter God's rest also cease from their labors as God did. We enter the Sabbath. And to try to... The book of Hebrews, you've got to kind of read the whole thing. Because it establishes its own way of talking about uh, what it means to follow God. But to try to make it very plain... We as a church are always going to be in the wilderness. We are always going to be learning these lessons that God teaches. Don't whine. Pay attention to God. Take risks. At the end of the journey in the wilderness, what we're heading towards is God's rest. And that's the way that the book of Hebrews talks about heaven. We are in the wilderness today, and the wilderness is a preparation to get to the promised land. We're in the wilderness today, but it is a preparation to get to God's kingdom. We are in the wilderness today, but that is how God prepares us for heaven. And so I just have to say, you're in the wilderness, and I wouldn't be anywhere else but with you. Thanks be to God. Amen. We come to a time now...